We are approaching the 15th of August and many of you must be remember that this date, 15th of August last year, marked an important moment in the history of both Asia and that of the world in fact. After an offensive that began in the 1st of May, the Taliban suddenly took over the whole of Afghanistan. The government with the former government which had been backed by the United States crumbled, collapsed. Ashraf Ghani left the country. This was even before the US troops had left the country and with as per an agreement with Afghanistan. So one year later, where does the country stand? What are the issues that actually dominate the region? How has the Taliban negotiated with various regional powers? What is the US doing? We'll be discussing all this in this episode of Mapping Fault Lines. We are joined by Prabir Purkaista. Prabir, so uh, we talked about this last year, the kind of uh, lightning offensive with which the Taliban took over Afghanistan. More correctly, the lightning collapse of the exactly. uh, US forces. Right, that, absolutely. <laughs> and the, of course, the US backed Back government forces, over yeah. there. Yeah. But let's face it, it was the collapse of the US forces or the withdrawal of the US forces absolutely. that led to that rapid collapse and the rapid capture of power right. by the Taliban. Absolutely. So at that point, we actually talked about how, of course, they've captured power, but now is where the difficult part starts because uh, you know, there are so many issues for the Taliban to take care of. The whole country was in a state of complete collapse. One year down the line, you know, quickly, let's uh, can quickly go through where Afghanistan stands today in terms of what was promised, for instance, in terms of what the expectations were. You know, first is, of course, the United States will claim uh, what we promised was in the context of what Taliban would or would not do. So they have captured uh, the whole of Afghanistan and we don't have to agree to it. We owe nothing to Afghanistan. That's the formal part of what they can say. The reality is that NATO, led by the United States, entered Afghanistan, took power, Really, the argument was this is only because of bin Laden, but the reality is they took over the whole country. And for almost 20 years, in fact, a little more than 20 years, they ruled the place. Not only did they rule the place, they essentially broke the existing structure of governance that existed. They created forces which were supposed to be loyal to them, but really bought with money. On top of that, there were the continuous aerial bombardment, so to say, by which targeted assassinations using drones, using other uh, mechanisms continued. And we don't know what the numbers are, but it could be as large as 20,000, 25,000 people were killed while the occupation was on. So it wasn't a war which was of war of trying to you know, take over the country, uh, take over the governments, but there's also a war in which force, uh, there are summary executions, so right. to say. And also that the, the American forces who were embedded in Afghanistan, they were fighting really this aerial war. They had, they had the bases which were quite insulated from the local population. They even had uh, food and other things prepared by people who came from India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, other places and uh, not the local population because they're quite scared of them. And then, of course, they were basically doing what's called the drone war and uh, various other missile strikes that were being executed on the ground. So this was the war which really broke the back of Afghanistan. And it was an unwinnable war. Afghanistan is not kind to people who want to come and rule it from outside. It's right. a very difficult country. It's a large country. And the 40 million people of Afghanistan is also not a small population. So the expectation that you could come from outside and rule it is an expectation that has never been fulfilled in Afghanistan. The British tried, they failed. And nobody really wants to get into Afghanistan to fight a land war over there. And the US thought that since it was doing an aerial war with some ground forces and with money, they could actually remake Afghanistan, which, as you know, has uh, really not succeeded. Right. The problem is that having done that, the US basically has said, we have no more responsibility for Afghanistan. Even the money that the Afghan treasury had with the US Central Bank, about $8 billion, was seized by the United States, an act which is really unparalleled in history, except the earlier seizure of Iran's uh, money, which was there in US banks. Not of this amount, right. but it was about, I think, what one billion is what Iran had claimed later. And then, of course, as we know, the uh, Venezuelan gold 
and just recently, of course, the Russian $300 billion lying with the right. US Treasury, US banks, and with the European Union banks. So these are the uh, new face of imperialism we are seeing today, by which you can see the country's assets, country's money, which is lying with the central bank, US central bank, because that's where people stored their dollar balances. So that is unfortunately the other part that post-war, Afghan government, Taliban government, whether we like it or we not, it's really ruling Afghanistan. There is no challenge to it as yet. Yes, small uh, disturbances here and there, resistance as there, Panjshir Valley having some occasional strikes taking place. The Islamic State, Khorasan, as it says, is also uh, carrying out few assassinations. But the reality is the Afghan government on the ground, if it has to give food and other resources, like uh, other facilities to its people, it desperately needs money. Right. Afghanistan does not produce, in the current con context of the war, is not going to be able to produce food for itself. Where does the food come from? How will they buy? These are all the questions which are there. Yes, Afghanistan has a lot of resources, but how do they actually get into that is the issue. And this is, I think, something which the world owes to Afghanistan. Yeah. But unfortunately, the US position is, I have no more responsibility. I have destroyed Afghanistan uh, in trying to pacify it. You know, this is the other part of it. I, in order to bring peace, I had to destroy it. But after having destroyed it, I have no responsibility towards right. it. This is the, really the crux of the issue. And the impact of it is not going to be in the United States. It's going to be on Pakistan. It's going to be on South Asia in a larger sense, but also in West Asia and Central Asia. Absolutely. And I think that's the key problem. All these countries can be destabilized. You're looking at 40 million Afghan people. It's not a small number. Absolutely. Right, Prabhupada, this actually brings us to the next question, which is uh, very relevant and which is also something we flagged at that time. That considering that the US and the NATO had withdrawn, the responsibility was really with the Central Asian powers, the Central Asian countries, Afghanistan's neighbors. And we've seen some amount of uh, you know, diplomatic initiatives over the past one year, several meetings. You know, the Taliban actually, at some level, although its isolation has not formally been ended, it has nonetheless been able to achieve some amount of representation here. So how do we see that situation today one year down the line? See, it's a question of having or learning to live with the Taliban. None of the surrounding powers, even Pakistan, is happy with the Taliban as it exists. Even Pakistan knows that Taliban is a destabilizing fact, uh, factor on its borders, that there are forces within Pakistan who also have ideologically similar positions to Taliban would like a completely Islamic Pakistan rule the Talibani way, shall we say. Right. So it's not something which Pakistan is comfortable with. Yes, it would like India to be out of that. That is a short-term goal it might have. But having Taliban on its borders with a Pashtun population in Pakistan, which is larger than the Pashtun population in Afghanistan itself, that's not a very comfortable situation. Then you have Iran, and there's a long conflict that Iran has had with the Taliban. Again, they have now sort of made up, so that tension is relatively less, but nevertheless, there is a tension over there too. Then we have Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan on the borders. All of them have a stake in Afghanistan. All of them also are worried about what would happen. And let's not forget also China, because this is also bordering, though it's a very small border, Xinjiang. So all of these areas have that issue that a destable, unstable Afghanistan with 40 million people who might have to, a large number of refugees might have to leave Afghanistan because it cannot sustain itself, right. is not a situation conducive to the stability of the region. So how do you stabilize Afghanistan? The reality is, of course, as we have discussed, the Taliban is essentially running Afghanistan today and there's not as any serious resistance to it. And having got that position, can they actually maintain it in a way that they can rebuild the Afghan state? And what does it cost the Afghan people? Because of the Taliban ideology hasn't changed. Right. They are still what I would call a medievalist force with guns. They have a modern power. 
in the sense they have the state, they have the guns, they have certainly military dominance over the situation, but the ideology they have is not conducive to quote unquote a modern society in any sense of the Absolutely. term, a modern nation in any sense of the term. How do they do it? Would it not lead to other divisions coming up? There are ethnic divisions in uh, Afghanistan as well. Will that come up? This time they seem to have a larger sweep. Earlier it has it seemed the Taliban was more confined to the Pashtun speaking people. This time they seem to have got their roots in other uh, communities as well. So to that extent it has a larger base. But can they really build again a modern state on the basis of what could be considered a medieval ideology is really the crux of the issue. And how do the surrounding powers, mm -hmm. and I'll put the key ones as Iran, uh, of course, Tajikistan, Ur Uzbekistan, uh, Pakistan, uh, China and Russia, T T Turkmenistan as the immediate powers, but also, as you said, China and Russia. And let's not forget the spoiler in the game which is the United States, because the United States may decide, okay, we couldn't do anything, we'll ensure that nobody does right. it either. So we'll have to see what do they do, because the U.S. role at the moment, if we look at the Central Asian larger picture, is that they can play the role of a spoiler, but they don't, really don't have any strong allies in the region who are willing to go with them and against others. So given that, that you have Iran as quote-unquote uh, enemy of the United States. You have China and Russia, who they see as global uh, competition. Do they have any roots in Central Asia itself? And I think for them, therefore, since not having a stake in the region, could also make them feel destroying whatever peace existed, this is in their favor. And therefore, Afghanistan to be kept as a pot, keep it stirring, keep the Taliban stirring over there, the, keep the Taliban pot stirring, not let them stabilize is also the position they could take. And in this, what do the other Central Asian republics do? would be a very important question. Absolutely. What does Pakistan do? Because Pakistan itself is in a deep financial and political crisis. And as I said, Pakistan itself is not, a very, uh, not in a very comfortable position internally, vis-a-vis -vis even its internal Talibanized uh, sections. So given that, these are the dangers that is there. India may feel that, okay, it's a zero-sum game. Pakistan lost something in Afghanistan. Uh, Taliban initially was favorable to Pakistan. Now there seem to be some tensions, but it's not a zero-sum game. It's in everybody's interest to bring peace to Afghanistan and reconcile for the time being what the Taliban is the military power over there. And how do we bring Taliban to the second half of the 20th century? Forget the 21st century. That's really our challenge. Absolutely. And Prabhupada, this brings us to the uh, final question, which, of course, what, last year when all of this happened, a big question mark came over NATO because there was divisions between the alliance, Emmanuel Macron and the French, for instance, raising issues. And we see one year down the line, the uh, Ukraine war has happened. NATO has acquired some fresh wind, seeming as belligerent and bellicose as ever. So how has NATO sort of, you know, uh, revamped itself or pivoted in the aftermath of Afghanistan and now with Ukraine? Well, you know, this is a very interesting question that you're posing. Any time the U.S. policy fails, it seems to revive with a fresh war. So it seems to need a war to be able to revive. So as you can see, it has the last 20 years. How many wars has it fought and lost? Iraq war, okay. Iraq war, they still formally have an occupation status in Iraq. Right. They still are able to maintain their forces uh, over there under an agreement that they have the right to do it, which the Iraq Assembly Parliament does not want to continue, past resolutions, but the U.S. is not leaving. Okay. The, even today, they have some outposts in Syria and they are siphoning off oil from right. Syria, as the recent pictures show. So that this the war in Syria is also one of those wars. I think we should add it to my list. But the other one is, of course, Libya. Still, destruction of Libyan state, that was mission accomplished. Have they got a stable Libyan state today? No. Civil war continues over there. So destruction of Iraq, yes. Destruction of Syria, partially successful. Destruction of Libya, fully successful. So destruction of Afghanistan is also successful. But 
where is the new state which emerges out of the destruction? The answer is none. So the failure in Afghanistan was that they had to leave before the deadline, that they actually could not withdraw right. without the, you know, their forces almost at the uh, edge of being overwhelmed in the Kabul airport. And if Taliban wanted, they could have actually done it. They let them go. So if you look at that, that breaking countries, destroying them, that's possible for United States. But building a new state, building a stable new state, that doesn't seem to be possible. So we are in the same situation in Ukraine now. Uh, in this kind of wars, the US is very good. In the dest destruction of an existing order, destruction of an existing state. And in this case, fighting Russia to the last Ukrainian, which is not my statement. Lindsey Graham has virtually said this, that the last Ukraine will fight to the last man. So he's virtually endorsed what critics have said. So I think that is, the, that is where the United States gets a fresh lease of life. In a new war, again coming out with this basically saying, we will bring defeat to the enemy, no longer peace to the region. I think that's, that's where the Ukraine uh, war is also headed, right. to one of these intractable wars which will go on as long as the Ukrainians are willing to pay with their bodies for what the NATO wants them to do, which is weaken Russia, see whether a part of Ukraine can be grabbed by ultimately Western capital, if not the full of Ukraine. Right. Thank you so much, Prabir. So it does seem that the United States has moved on to a fresh war, creating fresh tensions, creating for fresh disasters in yet another part of the world. Meanwhile, the people of Afghanistan, like you've seen in this video, going through a massive humanitarian crisis. Will the powers of the region be able to work together with the Taliban as is necessary to actually bring some relief to the people remains to be seen. We'll be taking a look at similar issues in future episodes of Mapping Fault Lines. Until then, keep watching NewsClick.